Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we'll be talking about expanding industry knowledge with video. And to walk us through this, we have Dan Carnavalli, who is the Power Systems Experience Center Manager at Eaton. So welcome, Dan. Hey, thanks, Chris. How you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You guys are just absolutely crushing it with your videos. Every time I go on LinkedIn, it seems like lately, and I'm seeing one of your videos out there on a new topic and I just think it's doing a, a phenomenal job. So I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Well, thanks for having a lot of fun with it. Absolutely. So, you know, you began really pushing a lot more educational video content out there that, that's really helping industry across the board. So maybe get us started. So why do you think it's important to make this shift uh, to help others via this means? Well, Chris, I think the main thing is, and we learned this through the Experience Center um, where I work, is that, you know, obviously people are visual learners. So anything that we can do visually is, is ideal. And I mean, as you know, the number two search engine is YouTube. So if we're looking for something important, we're going to go to Google probably and then YouTube. So um, video really works well. And the content that we're explaining, like, you know, some of the more complicated ones that we've put out recently, like reactive power or even current transformers, um, media multi switch gear, those kind of things, they can get pretty complicated. And then the other part of it is the industry is really shifting to this through this energy transition. And I think the things like the renewables and, you know, microgrids, things like that, that are being installed, the, the, the understanding of how the power flows through those um, pieces of equipment and systems gets pretty complicated. So video makes it really tangible and with the right B-roll and background, um, you know, pictures and, and other little video and animation clips it really can be explained in a really succinct way. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, I think it's become even more important, Dan, with, with COVID and the way that, you know, everybody's, they can't travel anymore. So, you know, speaking to, to the to folks that can't get around and how are you creating that virtual experience for them? And, and when you're designing this video, what, what's most important? We've been doing videos really in three basic categories. One is the, I'll call them more highly produced videos or, um, professionally done videos. And we, and we do those with a company out of Virginia called Metro Productions. And they've been kind of our partner for more than about 10 years to do. We've done probably more than 100 videos with them on different things like transformers and reclosers and solar and, and that kind of stuff. Um, they've been a great resource for us on the web, but also to supplement like our in-person training. So even before COVID, like I would create a video maybe on power quality or search protection. And if I was teaching a class on power quality, I might pull out that video and use like some of the clips out of that video itself. Um, in the past year, we've also done a tremendous amount, you know, with COVID, we've done a tremendous amount of um, virtual type events. So we've done anything from five minutes to eight hours. And honestly, um, you know, we've done pre-recorded stuff. We've done live stuff. We, we did a training class. One of the more interesting ones was for a, a class for a power systems, um, power quality class for a group of students in India. And it, it, they were 12 hours difference in time and we kind of did it virtually live. Um, so that kind of thing is pretty cool. And then we'll typically record those and post them so that they can watch them afterwards as well. And then the third part and thing that you've probably been seeing more on LinkedIn recently are these short videos that we do just on different pieces of content. One of the recent things we did was we did uh, frequently asked questions on harmonics. And I posted, I think 27 videos on that, anything from line reactors to phase shift and transformers, things like that. But we have another 50 or so in our, in our pocket that we're gonna kind of um, work through and film. And we found that those kind of videos that are not the overly highly produced ones are really effective as well. So we're trying to balance you know, those three levels of videos and production and, and give them to people that really can consume that content. No doubt. So, I mean, for those, for that second level, is that all in-house on with you and your team directly with outside that production company? Yeah. So we're doing, um, we've created, so we've outfitted our rooms um, with, with fixed cameras that we can use. And then we've, we have a mobile cart. It's kind of interesting because it's, it's mobile. It's very heavy, but it has a couple of UPSs on it. We have cameras with UPSs. So, we can literally completely detach from everything. Everything's wireless. And um, we can follow around through our substation and the microgrid and all the way down through the resi room, you know, really give a full blown tour of the experience center. And it's, it's been great. 
um, but about Eric Hurd, who works here in Santino Graziani, they, they kind of on the other side of it, really, to help do the production of that. That's very cool, man. I mean, and you mentioned, I think you said, what, he has 50 other topics that are in the background right now. I'm curious. I mean, how do you come up with those topics? Are you getting feedback from, you know, previous videos that's helping determine where you need to go and what you need to work on? Yeah, for the harmonics ones, we, we've kind of, I, I typically use questions that I get asked a lot of when I do, you know, in-person presentations. But, you know, normal normal times, we get seven or 8,000 people a year through here. So, when, when those people are here or when we have regular, um, you know, um, groups in, or even when we have the virtual ones, we get a lot of questions. So we kind of keep track of those. And, and our team here will have kind of brainstorming sessions and go through kind of the frequently asked questions and talk about them, you know, and we have a master list that we add those questions to so that we're, you know, we kind of keep track of them. And then we film about 15 or so of the professional ones every year. And so they like, we'll do five of them like we'll be doing five in March on residential type, you know, discussions for contractors and people like that. And then we'll do um, the shorter ones in between kind of more off the cuff. And I don't know if you saw recently the one we did on the fan wall, but um, Santino had just created a fan wall with the tic-tac-toe thing. So we kind of did that one. And, and that was, you know, more like just a, a quick one, but again, those are the ones that we would record. And then um, because somebody had a question about it, then, then um, do some editing on it. But some of the most fun we've had when we're sitting around trying to create these these things is is really um, coming up with the ideas. So the overcurrent protective device games one, for example, when Tom Dimitrovich and Eric and I were sitting around and, and we were talking about filming videos on fuses, breakers, and contactors. So each of us had, you know, Tom had fuses because he works for that division. I had breakers and, and Eric had contactors. And then it kind of became like a competition. Well, mine's better than yours kind of thing. And, and Tom's like, what if we had the overcurrent protective device games, you know, and, and we could like compete in like a little animation thing. Yeah. So all of a sudden we just, we were, we, it was just so fun because we were talking about things like that we never thought we would address. But then honestly, like the, the story that came out of there was, was really relevant in how each piece of equipment works. Yeah. I mean, you guys are making it fun. I think that's what I got from that, that, that one video series you mentioned, that was just a fun one to watch. It, it was educational, but uh, you could tell you guys are having a lot of fun while you're doing it. I think there was another one I saw with Eaton about it, like a game show around PLCs. The PLC one, yeah, that, they had a lot of fun with that one as well. And they got a lot of, uh, you know, and then they had live sessions after that. And what's good with those ones was that they actually had, you know, the content that they built and had little little learning episodes. You know, even though it was fun, there was a learning piece in there. And then they had a Q and A session after there, and they had it was really well attended, like you know, thirty thousand people attended or something like that. So, there's there's lots of stuff that you can do, you know, to do these short little learning things and then make them into something bigger. No doubt. I mean, and you already mentioned that you, you're seeing where some videos do better than others. So, I mean, what metrics are you measuring? How how do you know what's working and that you're reaching that your the targeted audience that you're going after? And that and that's a great question. You know, obviously metrics that people think of with videos is views. So when you go on YouTube and you see the number of views, you know, everybody would like to have the three million view kind of number on there. Um, and and that's definitely one of the metrics that we look for. But ours any, aren't anywhere near that yet. You know, we're hoping to get somewhere near, you know, in the in the hundreds of thousands, you know, eventually with some of these. But we're, you know, some of them like the, the, the you know, CT video, current transformer video. You know, that has 50 or 60,000 views and it's been out less than a year. Um, what we're trying to do is, is try to get views, but also try to get the right people to find these. So our target now is to really get um, to make them, again, a learning thing for the people that need this information. So if it's on reclosers, obviously it's a targeted audience, you know, with with people in the utility industry and people that are setting up these systems. But also maybe from a um, from an understanding of, you know, who who needs to understand how a recloser operates? Maybe the hospital that's trying to understand why the lights were blinking and stuff like that. Um, but of course we take the feedback from LinkedIn or YouTube as constructive criticism and we're always trying to make those better. So our, our metrics are ongoing and we're always trying to like, you know, enhance to make them better each time. And, and, and we get a lot of, you know, like, hey, don't try to be too goofy and sure that's fine. But you know, it's some, some people say be more goofy, you know, like. Yeah. I think you got to have fun with it because, I mean, you're also trying to – well, what I get a lot from your videos is uh, you're encouraging people to come to industry. And, you, and if you reach yeah. that, that next generation with some, some funny antics or things like that, I mean, hey, that's, a, that's just 
I just think it's a good good strategy, man. So, you know, hats off to you. I'm, I am curious, you know, COVID shifted everything. We're on Teams, we're on Zoom all the time now. People's cameras on, but being on with your camera on in a Teams meeting is a little different versus like, you know, being comfortable in front of a camera for that you know you're making a video on, you know, and and you're you're fortunate you had the face video. I have the face radio, so it's you know it's that's that's better. <laughs> So, but yeah, I, I don't know about that, but yeah. So I mean, how do you get everybody comfortable uh, being in front of that camera, man? Well, you know, the funny thing is some people will never be comfortable. I mean, when you think about it, it's just, it is what it is. And you kind of have to deal with that. Um, but you also have to think about like, so so let's say we were creating a video on a specific um, application. And, and I'll kind of say that in a way that, you know, it's important that we talk about applications, maybe not so much specific products. So if I'm going to, uh, to do an application on a circuit breaker or something, I might take somebody from the circuit breaker division or the transformer division to do theirs or whatever. But, you know, if they're not comfortable on it, um, we'll, we'll coach them through and, and we try to make it fun for them. Um, the group that we work with to do the produced ones, they, they are really good at, at kind of making people relax in front of the camera. Um, it, it's very low stress. We'll use a green screen if we need to and stuff like that and, and really try to really make it um, more relaxing. But I think for my team personally, like, you know, Santino, Eric, uh, Ariana, the people that you've seen in some of these videos multiple times, um, you know, when you think about it, um, after one or two times, I think it becomes it becomes pretty good. And, and I felt that myself. I, I feel like I'm getting worse rather than better, but some of them are getting a lot better. So I kind of let them do more of them. But I, it's funny, you know, when I first started doing them, everybody hates to see their first cut of the video. And I was like, oh God, do I, did I really do that or say that or act that way on the camera? So, you know, the advantage that we have here though, I think, you know, we do training in person all, you know, every day of the year when we're here. And so basically a lot of what the videos are is just a repeat of the, the stories that we're telling, the things that we're doing here. So it's a very comfortable and natural thing for us. And I think that make that helps a lot. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, for me, it's just reps. You know, mm -hmm. when we first started the podcast, you know, I was nervous just just going through the question, the format. But the more reps you get at anything, I think the better we get. So just that 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 reps being in front of the camera and just being comfortable, and then you know the the, the nerves go away. Plus, you always know if it's terrible. And I've, I've had that feedback uh, from from our marketing team before too. You can always just redo it. You know, so that's that yeah. option is out there. So, you know, how about you mentioned something. And I wrote down, you focus on applications, not products. And I think that's probably one of the most salient pieces of, of advice that I've heard, because that's definitely where we're at with a lot of our with a lot of our content that we're trying to create. It's not about the product. It's about the problem we're trying to solve. Any advice that you would have for others that are wanting to tri try to find ways to support an industry that, that you've learned along the way? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a key one. Again, I'll reiterate that, which is basically if you if you put a product video out, um, your team will watch the video, your company will watch the video. They'll give it all great marks on all the YouTube and LinkedIn and all that. And but but when when people that are trying to use that product are looking for it, they're not looking for it as the product itself. They want to see how it's applied. They want to see what works, what doesn't work, how it works with other stuff. So that's a big point. But there's a lot to share here. I mean, I think there's. The best advice that I can, I can say is if you're going to do a video is if you're going to do a video, you have to have a hand in the writing or at least editing of the script because, you know, you want to be able to use the words that, you know, you kind of, you know, have in your mind or, um, or what you want to say, because really um, I'll ask my team to take the ones now that they intend to record and I'll work to edit the story, you know, put it together. But I used to actually write all the scripts and then, you know, like they would come and they say, well, can I say it a little differently? And it would come out a lot more natural if it's your own words. So, you know, frankly, it's more believable when you do that. So um, I think that's number one. The, the, the second thing that uh, I would focus on is like when we started, we used to memorize everything. And I just, you know, I kept telling, you know, the guys from Metro, I'm like, I'm, I, don't, I don't believe in teleprompters. I don't think it looks as natural and all this kind of stuff. But honestly, I'm a huge believer now. And it, the reason I am is because it takes a lot of the stress out of you. And it also, you know, you don't get that roll back in your head. What was I going to say? Like your eye, you know, the eyes always come off the screen and you're, you're literally trying to read it out of your brain. Um, but, but honestly, the really good teleprompter operators are key, right? So 
you can have a teleprompter and do a horrible job at it. But if you have somebody that really knows what they're doing, and, and this is probably one of the learning lessons goes back to how do people get comfortable. We teach them how to use a teleprompter. And, and you probably know that that's, that's one of the harder things to do. But if you have somebody that knows how to run it and you're not chasing them, they're, they're kind of following you the right way. It works really well. The third thing I'll say is make it the right length. And I can tell you that there's, there's everybody that I've ever talked to and, and they say, well, your videos are too long or, you know, you, you shouldn't do a video more than two to five minutes because nobody will ever watch it. And then I show them, well, we're getting views on them and here's why. It ha if it has the right content, people will watch them. Um, there's any of the electrical videos that I've found that I watch, you know, personally from contractors or from Electroboom or any of these other guys, I mean, they're 10, 20 minutes long, but they're teaching something. So if you're learning something and you're engaged, the, the right, uh, you know, the right length will come naturally. It, it doesn't have to be this length or, you know, too long or too short. Right. Um, the, the fourth thing I'd say is um, get some videos done. And, and I think it goes back, Chris, to your point where you said, you know, you got some feedback and said, oh, I should redo this. Um, don't focus on perfection because you'll never get there. So start getting them done, refine, refine, refine until you get the right recipe. You know, once you do that, then I think you'll you'll find that, um, you know, that they'll become a lot better videos. And then finally kind of breaking the video down, uh, you know, 25% of the work is having a solid script. So we, we work very hard at getting that script right. And sometimes we're writing it the day of shoot, but that's just more because everybody's so busy. <laughs> but um, the second thing is, you know, 25% is filming. And if you have the right crew, the right equipment, and everything, it goes smoothly. Um, you know, good camera, 4K, you know, we'll talk about those kind of things maybe later. But 50% um, is really in the editing and B-roll and the extra pictures, the equations, the text, the stuff that really, you know, kind of goes on screen and the stuff that really tells the whole story that fills in the detail. Um, if, if we don't have that done right, like... We do three major iterations on every video, the highly produced ones, I'll say. And if we would show somebody the first cut, they would they would say it's horrible, you know, and I think it's not great, right? But what we do is we wait until we get kind of to the point where we know that the right stuff's in it. And then you show, you know, how it looks. But you have to have the right vision to know what it looks like at the end before you can kind of get there. So that, those are some of the main things that I would say if someone's going to try to do these videos. And that's great stuff. I mean, it's stuff that we're learning right now. Uh, scripting, having your subject matter experts have a big piece in that scripting is important, you know, and you're right. Cause that, that can set a, a good pace and, and make sure you, the video goes where it wants to go. But there were just some really uh, excellent areas right there. I mean, I don't worry about length either, Dan. I think the length, the length is what it is. If you're providing meaningful content, you know, if that's yeah. 30 minutes or if that's 30 minutes, so long, if it's, it's, helping serve someone to me that's what it's all about you know i'm curious because i got a chance to go to the experience center and you guys have some just it blows you away when you're up there but with what i remember the most were all the analogies the visual aids the i mean you have some like that water uh, graph thing on the wall that shows how power works how do you come up with these ideas and, and really tie that to information that helps people you know, Chris, I have a, a saying right here on my desk. It says, if you if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. And I know a lot of people have heard that or said that maybe, but but to us, that means, you know, if you can simplify the message to a six-year-old, then you can explain it to anyone from six to 106, you know? So, you, you know, let's say we use the surge demo as an example where we blow up the light bulb, you know? I can turn on the light bulb, plug in a surge strip, you know, put 7,000 volts on it, and the light bulb stays on. Then I take the surge protector off and I do the same thing and the light bulb blows up. And, and so a six-year-old could understand that. Now, if it's a you know very technical engineer and they want to understand you know the ins and outs of surge protection, we can go on and talk about it for three, four hours after that. But we start there with the demos. So that's probably um, you know why we we start with the simplification of the demo. So the water analogy one, you know, the the you know. The demos that we build out of fun, frankly, are kind of the most most interesting because, you know, you get some like the the water analogy we started from a squirt gun story, you know, that we talked about. And you say, you know, every time you pump up a squirt gun, you build up pressure and, you know, pressure is like voltage. And then you pull the trigger and you get current. Right. So we said, well, every time we tell that story, every time people come in, why don't we just build an analogy like that and build it on the wall? And it, it was really cool. 
Um, and then the pump storage demo we build out of the microgrid dis you know, discussion where you talk about um, pump storage from utility system, you know, a lake at the top of the hill, a lake at the bottom of the hill, and you know, those kind of things. And then the one we talked about earlier, the um, the fan wall, we needed a three by three fan matrix or fan wall. And, um, and we were looking at it, we're like, hey, that looks like a perfect tic-tac-toe board. So we got a, you know, a few lights and next thing you know, we ended up having a, a little demo based on that. But that's honestly, Chris, that's like some of the most fun is dreaming up these things. It really feels like you're, you're really allowing yourself to be pretty creative and then it flows into the videos that we create around them. I love it, man. I think it's, it's great. And I also love, I've seen some of your videos. Uh, I believe you have your daughter involved with some of them. Is that right? Yeah. yeah Kendall. She was in the water and algae one. I, that's probably still one of my most favorite ones just because it, it just was fun with having her in there. And actually all my kids have been in one of the videos or the other along the way. So yeah, it's been, it's been fun. That's cool, man. That is so cool. Now how about for, for the technical listener out there who wants to get started, uh, and, and really create, start creating more of these types of videos to help people. Any, any tools, processes, things that you found helpful to, to, to get going? Yeah, I mean, like I said, we use, you know, the professional group to do some of the stuff, but we've been doing a lot more on our own. And so when we do our own, we use Adobe Premiere Pro for like our own editing and stuff like that. Um, and if you're using uh, like um, iPhone or something, I mean, some phone cameras are awesome. And so you could really do well, but I will tell you, you know, this kind of thing, and if you can see that on there, like a gimbal, um, or like this kind of gimbal, um, those things are invaluable. I mean, for like $100 or $200, you get really, really good quality as far as walking around and, and making sure your camera's not bouncing because those things just become a distraction. And the, the last thing you want to do is, it, what I've found by doing this for a long time is the more distractions you have in the videos, the more um, complaints you get about this or that or whatever. And people are quick to just judge you based on you know, what you did wrong. But the fact that you created something is, you know, so try to do it the best you can. Um, I think teleprompter, I mentioned that earlier, um, or even just large printed prompts, you know, you should have something in front of you to be able to figure out what's going on. Um, and it's, it's really more important so you don't leave something out, especially if you're talking about a very specific thing and you say, well, I didn't want to leave that particular part out like some of the notes that I wrote up for today, I want to make sure that I hit certain things, you know, to make sure that we didn't leave things out. I would say use a microphone always. Um, sound is super important and it can make or break it just like the, you know, the camera bouncing around. And there's, again, inexpensive microphones that you can hook up to almost any camera. Um, you won't be, you know, you won't be disappointed if you have a little bit extra and, and you can kind of blend some of the stuff with Adobe and things like that to make it better. I think when you're in the editing process and, and you miss something in recording, that's probably one of the worst kind of feelings because now you know you have to go back and think about how you created all that stuff. So thinking ahead about what you're going to do is, is really kind of the, the technical part that I would most kind of guide people to is, is kind of plan it out so that you know they don't miss th things along the way. Right. No doubt. <clears throat> I mean, we use Premiere Pro ourselves uh, and I know for that, that's a great software platform. I am curious uh, on the, the promotion of your videos. Do you, do you guys use any software to help promote like through your, your social pieces or is that done through marketing? Is yeah. that marketing at, at Eaton? You know, we, our marketing group, which actually I'm somehow attached to and, and kind of in a good way. Right. So we, we actually are able to promote through our marketing group, through our you know PR things, social media, through Eaton pages and stuff like that. Um, so we we do our own um, promotion through, as you've seen a lot of stuff on LinkedIn and everything. And then some of the other pages that we do with video content, um, we we post through our our social media channels. Um, software wise, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what they're using specifically to do that, but we use Brightcove internally to to house all our videos which is kind of our internal method of, you know, like mimicking what's on YouTube. Um, but, but basically it's, it's been great, you know, kind of hosting the videos internally, externally. And when we, when we do something quick, the nice thing is that we can post it quickly on our own with a big company. You know, a lot of times it takes, there's a process behind, you know, posting things. So we want to, when things need to be timely, we, we're allowed to post on our own, on our own, you know, personal LinkedIn things or whatever. And that's, that's kind of the way I do it. Cool, oh, man. That's very cool. So what's been the most fun? If you look back at all of it, you got so much videos you've done. What, what stands out? Yeah, I mean, I, you mentioned it earlier, but I think the water analogy is probably the most fun. You know, here, here's Santino, who's a PhD student and kind of a longtime intern 
uh, working here and my then nine-year-old daughter, Kendall, you know, and, and, and the goal was for him to explain, you know, starting with the squirt gun kind of analogy, you know, how does electricity work? And, you know, so if you haven't seen it at the end, basically, you know, you, you go through and, and, you know, Santino explains all the different parts, resistors, voltage, Ohm's law, this and that, whatever. And, um, and Kendall's just like, okay, yeah, makes sense, makes sense to me kind of thing. But at the end, um, she also does gymnastics. So we're like, at the end, why don't you do a cartwheel? When you're done with cartwheel, flip over, get the squirt gun and squirt Santino in the face. And she's like, I could do that, you know? So what, what you didn't know though, was when we were making the video to make it really dramatic, we actually had, you know, uh, three of us there with squirt guns. So when she was squirting them, we were just drenching him with the squirt gun. So it made it so much more fun. Um, but, but, you know, honestly, even since then, we've done things with like dinosaurs and the, uh, in the maintenance video, you know, hospital scenes, you know, hockey practice, um, Zoom meetings on the, you know, the, the recent KVAR video, that, that was fun because, you know, everybody's stuck on these Zoom meetings. So we did the KVAR one with a Zoom meeting at the beginning and even had Eric on mute, you know, talking. And, and you know, Santino's like, Eric, you're on mute. Take yourself off. You're like, so it's so like, again, it just need, needs to be kind of natural. And that's the part, you know. So it's now part of the challenge, you know, that we have, you know, writing the scripts is come up with a really creative theme. And it's not always just about being funny. It's, it's sometimes, you know, just you know, trying to create something, you know, creative. So yeah. fun. And you, but the creative part is, is, is what you guys are just doing a phenomenal job of. I remember the, uh, the, the Jurassic Park one video. I mean, that was just so funny, man, but it, it, it was a great piece of educational content. It just, it had that, that, uh, that, piece to it that just was inter very entertaining no thanks cool man well this has been a lot of fun man. i mean i think you helped a lot of people out there through this conversation think through how they could use video we we call it eco ask why we save the why to the end and uh so if you if you, the why behind educational video you know why do you think that is why do you think that's going to make such an impact on others that want to learn and and come to this industry well, you know, Chris, if I think about it, you know, we're all in the same boat, right? Like, so if you're, you live in a world where like, if your lawnmower is broken or if you're laying under your car, how many times have you ever been like laying under your car, you're trying to move the oil drain plug and you keep looking at it like, is that the oil plug or is that the transmission fluid? And, you know, you're like, I should probably look that up. So you go to YouTube, you find it. And then, you know, a couple minutes later, you're like, okay, that's the right one, you know, because I know people that have done the opposite and it's always like, oh crap, you know, so. Um, but I say in the electrical industry, you know, we're losing our mentors left and right to retirement. I mean, that's that's the key, right? So we're when you think about like we have to train the next generation, and you know, they are trained, they they learn by visualization. They're they're multitasking, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff all the time from the internet. Like I've I've had tons of interns here, and you know, so many times I'll be sitting there talking to an intern and they're looking down at their phone, you know, and, and I'm asking them a question and I'm like, I'm like so distracted by them looking at their phone, but here's the, here's the problem with that is they'll literally pull out the, the answer to the question I just asked them. That might be a pretty complicated thing, but they're looking it up while they're talking to me and answer, you know, and so that's the way they learn. So I think we have to think about why, you know, why they're learning that way, how they're learning and how we're going to kind of supplement that to make sure that, you know, you know, like the first couple of times that happened to me, I almost lost my mind. You know, I was thinking it's kind of a lack of respect, but that's, the reality is that's how they learn and, you know, multitasking and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the most recent series that we're working on, um, I think, and this kind of goes to the why also is for underprivileged kids. So we're working with these, this group called M powerhouse in Pittsburgh, you know, the, the guy there, Terry Smith, he's, he's been a great kind of friend of the program here, like for the experience center. Um, he'll bring in eighth graders to, you know, kids in high school that are usually from, you know, some of the areas in Pittsburgh where, you know, these kids have doesn't, they don't have anybody that's ever gone to college, you know, in their family. So this is, this is a new thing for them to really experience something around a technical industry and the STEM programs and stuff like that. Um, so we're happy to work with them. And, and the why also is to really give them a sense of, you know, they could be an electrician or an engineer or somebody in the STEM field or somebody even that just works in a facility that makes solar panels or could, you know, perhaps, you know, do accounting for a firm like Eaton, you know? And so really to have that knowledge and that understanding of what's out there is why we're doing these videos. So, so the next five videos that we're going to put together for them are really going to highlight 
uh, what, what's available in the electrical industry and why these kids might want to consider that so that they can go out and make a good career and a, and a good living at it. Um, and really, we need to do that for the next generation or we'll, we'll kind of have a problem. So. We will. We will. Well, you guys are doing a great job, Dan, and, and thank you so much. But we'll, we'll put for the listeners out there links to all the areas to reach you, Dan, uh, to go to the Experience Center. Check those things out, definitely the YouTube channel and, and, and to any, any different areas that you want to share. We'll make sure those are in the show notes for our listeners. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.